Hello, and welcome back to the IVF Daddies podcast. Today, we've got the amazing Dr. Stephanie Rothenberg. She is a board certified obstetrician, gynecology, and reproductive endocrinologist who works for Pacific Northwest Fertility based in Washington. Back in 2021, they founded the LGBTQ part of the business. And Dr. Stephanie Rothenberg is a huge advocate. She has a focus on fertility preservation for transgender patients. And because the 31st of March every year is Transgender Visibility Day, we thought it would be amazing for her to talk to us more about transgender and non-binary fertility. So here we are. Stephanie, hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Very welcome. First things first, can you give us a brief explanation of what is transgender fertility? How does it work? When you hear, so cisgender is what we typically think of for people who have testicles and identify as male or people who have ovaries and identify as female. So that's cisgender. Transgender is where you, the gender that you identify as is different than your sex assigned at birth. And there's a spectrum of that. So people who, it can be very binary that if you have testicles and you identify as female, then you would be a trans female, but it also is a spectrum. There are people who have, have ovaries and identify that they want to be masculinizing. And so might not identify as male, but would consider themselves to be non-binary and be somewhere in between. Have you seen a rise in patients who are on that spectrum of identifying as male or female over the past, I don't know, since you've been doing this? I'd say yes. And when you look at generational differences between the baby boomers and Gen X and millennials and Gen Y and Alpha, it seems to be that more people are identifying as trans or non-binary. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are pursuing any sort of gender affirming treatment, but might socially be living differently. I feel that people are just more open in talking about how they identify. I don't know that it necessarily means that it's more common, but it might just be more okay to talk about. Yeah. What, what do you mean by gender affirming treatment? Yeah. So gender affirming treatment is an umbrella of people who have gender dysphoria, which is the discomfort associated with a mismatch between your sex assignment and birth and your gender identity. And gender affirming treatment is used to treat gender dysphoria. So that it can include how you dress and how you present socially, but it also includes medications and potentially surgery as well. And there, it's very a personal thing of what you might use to help you feel like you're living in the body that you're supposed to live in. How do you treat your patients when they come to you and what access do they have to have a consultation and when it's time to freeze their sperm or their eggs they have to reassure their gender by the organs that they have how do you treat the body dysmorphia typically have other care providers who are helping to treat their gender dysphoria and when they come to me, we're specifically talking about fertility, but also just being really sensitive to how my process that we'll discuss might affect their gender dysphoria. And so that's something that I spend a lot of time focusing on. Of This is how this typically works. These are ways that we can modify it in order to have this process feel more comfortable for you. So typically people are dealing with their and treating their gender dysphoria with a mental health care provider, with a primary care doctor or an endocrinologist, and then come to me as this adjunct to talk about fertility or fertility preservation. Do you have the ability to liaise with those other people that they're talking to, or does it have to yeah. be confidential, or how does it all work? It's a pretty tight community. I'm in Seattle, and so we're very privileged to have a really robust LGBTQIA community here and of providers. On Friday, I'm giving a talk at a, a hospital's putting on an LGBTQIA symposium that I'm speaking at. And so there's a really strong community of providers and we just communicate with each other of, it's a really personal process of 
them reaching out to me directly. They might send me a text and say, hey, I have a patient. Can your office reach out? But also just communicating with other providers. Hey, this is a service that we provide. This is a safe space for people who might be really deep in their gender dysphoria. And they can come and talk to me if they want to. If generally we talk about somebody and they're a pretty young woman, normally they don't really think about being a mom. And a person that is transitioning, on top of that, having the idea of creating a family, sometimes is not in the books. And I know now that we have a movement where we have a lot more support from parents to have their kids transition. And how is the difference from a person that transitioned post puberty or a person that is transitioned prior puberty? Yeah, so that's a really, it's a really interesting question. So when we think about adolescent fertility preservation, like that's a very specific group that has really special considerations. And the initial kind of study and data is looking at adolescents and their desire for fertility preservation is actually in cancer patients. And you would be really surprised of how many of these kids know that they want to be parents someday. This kind of assumption that maybe kids aren't able to think about that or don't have thoughts about whether they want to be a parent someday. It's not, that's not universal. There are a lot of kids who are like, I want to have a kid someday. And so it's really important to ask and include them. The interesting difference between transgender adolescents who are thinking about fertility preservation and cisgender kiddos who are doing cancer treatment is that transgender children are much more likely to say that they want to build their family with adoption or foster care compared to cisgender kids who are more likely to say that they want to use their own genetic material. And there's some really interesting kind of theories about that, like why would that be? And I was speaking with a psychologist who treats a lot of kiddos with gender dysphoria. And one of her theories is that a lot of these kids aren't sure that they're going to have a partner someday who loves them, who would raise to the, they would want to raise a family with, and aren't totally sure that they're going to survive, right? right? That they're so deep in their gender dysphoria, which is really hard to hear. And they want all children to be loved and supported. And so really gravitate towards the idea of adoption or foster care. And so we do see a, few, a smaller proportion of transgender kids seek fertility preservation compared to cisgender kids with cancer. And it's still in the beginning part of trying to understand like why that is. But that's one interesting theory. Which is fascinating because when you think about it, we all want to be loved. But to mm -hmm. grow up knowing that you feel different from the outset. You're like, I don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable with my own skin. I don't feel comfortable with the, the way my body is. Will I ever find somebody who's going to love me for me? That's really yeah. That's tough, yeah. right? Um, and that's why I see a lot of people who come back later, that they're in their 20s or 30s, that they are their gender dysphoria is under control. They feel like they're in the body that they're supposed to be in. And so they're thinking, oh, maybe I do want to have genetically related children. Maybe this is actually important to me now that I'm not deep in this dysphoria. And when I talk about this and when I talk to patients, there's no cutoff of if you didn't do this before you started estrogen or testosterone, that there's no options for you, right? Come to me wherever you're at and let's talk about it. There might be options. And so I think that's one of the biggest messages that I send out is even if this isn't something you want to talk about or think about or do before you start gender affirming therapy, that does not mean that you can't come back and see me later because there's so many ways to build a family. So in that same topic of somebody, let's say you, somebody that's going through the process, they find out a healthy way to transition. They find out a healthy way to finally feel comfortable in their body mm -hmm. that they think they they always thought that they belong and they come back to you and they want to proceed with fertility uh, mm -hmm. normally i believe that when somebody goes to a fertility clinic especially in the heteronormative couples there's a fertility issue so there are struggles mm -hmm. when you have somebody that is transgender and already said you mm -hmm. know what I'm loved, I want to have a family, I want to do it mm -hmm. with my genetic background. What is the hormone process? 
I think that to take a little bit of a step back, whenever I'm seeing anybody, cis, trans, LGBTQIA, heterosexual, my job is really to source ingredients. Do you have sperm? Do you have eggs? Do you have a place to put them? And it's as simple as that. I say this to my patients all the time of, you're just a normal human standing in front of me. I don't care what if you have sperm or eggs or not, or if we're using them, or if you have a uterus, what are we missing? What ingredient are we missing? Are we missing all three? Are we missing one? Are we missing two? Like, how do we get those things? And so really it's simple. And when I, when I talk to other fertility providers or OBGYNs, I'm like, this is not hard. Ultimately, I don't care what your pronouns are. I don't care like if you identify as gay or lesbian or pan or ultimately those things, those are important, but they're not necessary for me to get make complicated. It's all about ingredients. Okay. And that's just the normalizing thing. And I think that people find that really soothing of, oh, I'm just a normal person. I'm not like yeah. this super so special person that's really challenging it's it must be quite refreshing as well for to sit in front of a doctor and say you are you and i mm -hmm. need these three things and we're mm -hmm. going to get them one way or another so yeah. you focus on that your you being you and i'll focus on what i need oh. to do my job that's got yeah. to be so liberating for them I think it helps them feel comfortable f faster because it's intimidating to come to a fertility doctor, no, no matter who you are. And so many people in the trans non-binary community have had terrible interactions in the medical community. And that's my primary goal. This is a safe place. You are a normal human and we're going to take care of you and help you build your family, however that looks. Due to the fact that transgender people showing their government name to a doctor is already mm -hmm. uh, a hard thing to do yes. when uh, we get to normalize or have a safe space for them that is already huge and the aspect when it has to come with hormones and treatment yeah how does that play out it comes down to do you have ovaries or do you have sperm? So we can start with somebody who has ovaries. So somebody who has ovaries and are masculinizing, typically are on things, most commonly testosterone, but that's sometimes they're on hormone blockers as well, but typically testosterone. Testosterone is really interesting because the, the ovaries actually don't seem to mind it that much. So they're pretty forgiving of being on testosterone. So there definitely are people that you'll hear that don't even come in to see me for fertility clinic in a fertility clinic that might stop testosterone or even miss a couple doses. If they have a partner with sperm, get pregnant at home without any help. So that's something that happens a lot. And we, it's harder to collect data on because they're not, that's not happening in the medical environment to study and understand. When I see people on testosterone, we talk who want to use their eggs we talk about, okay, how do you feel about being pregnant? Is that, do you want to use your uterus? If the answer is yes, we want to use my uterus, then we talk about coming off of testosterone because you need to come off of testosterone if you're planning to be pregnant. If you're planning to use your eggs and not be pregnant, then we talk about pros and cons of staying on testosterone to do the process of IVF and getting eggs out or stopping it. The general recommendation is to stop it for a few months before you go through the process of doing an egg retrieval and getting eggs out, but that's not the only answer. When you're on hormones, there's just more question marks of outcomes. How well do you stimulate? How well do your eggs fertilize? Or do you get fewer embryos when you go through the process of IVF? Are there any effects on kiddos? who are exposed to testosterone. So there's more question marks here, but what, from what we know with the limited amount of data is that actually people do pretty well of getting eggs out. And it's really based more on their age, how many, their ovarian reserve and these things that we look at for you know, cis women going through. Yeah. I have a pretty frank discussion of pros and cons. If going off testosterone is a deal breaker, then maybe we don't go off testosterone. Is testosterone pills or is it injected or how do how does that yeah, work great question typically it's an injection a weekly injection that's the most common way it also can be done topically like creams <laughs> or excuse me gels but typically it's injections weekly injections. and this is a little more of a basic 
human anatomy um, yeah. question. Apparently, women are born like you mate your eggs in your mother's womb. Mm -hmm. If you haven't hit puberty and you want to freeze your eggs, where are those eggs? Yeah, the most eggs that somebody with ovaries ever has is when they're a 20 week fetus. Okay, so six to seven million eggs. By the time you're born, it's down to a million. So already eggs are just like oh getting God. out. By the time you hit puberty, it's about 300,000. At the age of 40, it's about 25,000. And by the time you met, hit menopause, it's about 1,000. So the way that the ovary works every month is, I'm going to doodle for you if that's okay. I'm a doodler. So the ovary has these little follicles in there that are called antral follicles, and they have immature eggs in them. Okay. And at the beginning of the month, the brain sends down a hormone called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And that's how the brain talks to the ovary. And there's a big pool of eggs that hears that message and they actually compete against each other. And only one wins and ovulates and all the rest of them die. It's super inefficient. Okay. This is how you go through millions of eggs in your life, even though you don't ovulate millions of times. Every month you're just wasting them. So what we're doing with ovarian reserve testing is we're trying to estimate the size of that pool. And the only thing that predicts is how many eggs we get with one round of IVF or egg freezing. Because what we do in that process is basically just a big trick on your ovaries where we give you more of this hormone to try and stop that competition from the, between the eggs and just get more eggs to grow at once. So I'm not using any eggs you wouldn't have used anyway. It doesn't make you less fertile. You don't go through menopause sooner. We're just like rescuing eggs that otherwise would have died. So you have, you're talking to somebody who has ovaries and that person here has come into you. How do you see how many the eggs are in the ovaries? So we do that with ovarian reserve testing. There, we do it with an ultrasound. So typically this is done vaginally. For some people, that is really dysphoric and not something that they're comfortable with. So that's something that we talk about. That's the best way to see the ovaries is with a ultrasound probe into the vagina. For some people, that's not something that they're interested in doing. And so we can do it abdominally. So just ultrasound on the belly. But optimally, it's done with a vaginal ultrasound. And we're doing what's called an antral follicle count, where we just count how many little follicles we can see between both of the ovaries. The second test is a blood test for a hormone called AMH, anti-mullerian hormone. And that's a hormone that's made by the caretaker cells of eggs. So the more eggs you have, the more caretakers you have, the more this hormone is. So I have some people who are like, I don't even want to do an ultrasound. Like, maybe I'll just do this blood. Okay. Let's say I have a family and I have my kids and one of my kids wants to go through transition mm -hmm. and a process where they haven't even reached puberty and they have a uh, uterus. Uh, can I, what do you, what can I freeze? How can I say, yeah. or can I just wait and not do anything? So you're asking about potentially a kiddo who goes on puberty blockers, right? So in the very early part of puberty would stop some, would start a medication to prevent the progression of what we call their natal puberty. So if they have testicles, male puberty, if they have estrogen, female puberty, and that's happening more common for kiddos who have gender dysphoria earlier that we're identifying it sooner and putting that on that putting them on that puberty blocker that's reversible if you stop it then they progress through puberty normally but it gives time for families for a kiddo to spend some time getting care and figuring out what their gender identity is and what they want these are the trickiest patients to talk about fertility preservation okay because the ovary or the testicle hasn't gone through that process of puberty and maturing and so for testicles, they really need to be pretty advanced in male puberty in order to make sperm. Okay, so pretty far through puberty. For ovaries, they also need to go through a little bit further, but maybe we could get eggs out sooner. So that's really tricky. The, the best option is to actually freeze part of the ovary or freeze part of the testicle. So what's called ovarian tissue cryopreservation or testicular tissue cryopreservation, okay? And this is experimental. I helped develop a study protocol at the University of Pittsburgh for both, specifically for transgender 
kiddos to do this. So that's an option that can be done. The tricky part is that we don't have the technology right now to actually be able to use the tissue because ideally you reimplant it into the person later. Oh, right? okay. And that's what we do for cancer patients. But for somebody who's transgender, that's not a great option, right? You don't, you want, don't want that hormone in there later. So we have to be able to develop eggs or sperm in the lab from that really young tissue. And right now we don't have that technology, but for a child who's 12 and wants to have a child in 20 years, there's a decent chance that we have that technology in 20 years. So that's still considered experimental, but for a lot of, when I see families or children who are early in puberty, most of them don't say, oh yeah, let me just stop my puberty blockers. Let me just go through my puberty that I don't want in order to have eggs or sperm. That's not an awesome option. I guess also you're listening, you are listening to them. You're listening to what they want. Yeah. Um, so a question for you. So that tissue, how is that done? Do you do take a biopsy? Do you, how does it work? It's a surgery to take out part of one ovary or part of one testicle. So it does involve a surgical procedure. So it's not without risk and also can, especially for taking out part of the testicle, you're sore afterwards. And so that might be dysphoric as well of if you, your penis and testicles are really dysphoric, having a sore scrotum doesn't sound very fun. So that might be a deal breaker. So I feel like what I'm hearing is that there's, it plays a lot of psychological issues more than the biological issues to do this. What do you think is bothering people to have allowed transgender people go through IVF? Or what are the obstacles that you think they face or you face when it comes to progress to create a family for transgender people? I think the, some of the challenges for patients who want to come and talk about fertility, I think for young people who are transitioning, they have to have a supportive family. Insurance coverage, a lot, the vast majority of the time is not going to cover this type of care. And so that's a huge barrier. So if you're young and you're 14, 15, 16, 17, like you have to have a parent who's or a guardian who's invested in this and is going to help you facilitate this. And sometimes I just talk to parents. I don't actually talk to the to the child. Does somebody need a, the legal document to confirm if you're underage? Yeah. So for our consent forms, you have to have a legal, like a parent or a legal guardian sign the consent. We have a consent portion and then we have an assent. That's what the patient signs. But from a legal standpoint, yes, you have to have a supportive parent unless you're like legally emancipated. And it gets really tricky when it starts, when we start talking about reproductive care, um, it gets legally messy. And this comes back into when I think about talking to people, they need, they want to feel safe, secure, heard and cared about. And I think if you are 13, 14, 15 going through this and your family's not supportive, that's mm -hmm. gotta be, again, that's got to be super hard and feeds into that whole emotional yeah. dysphoria and confidence it's got to be so tricky yeah. when you are talking to teenagers who are in that situation mm -hmm. i mean are you even allowed to talk to them yes i am allowed and sometimes i'll speak just to if you have a 16 or 17 year old that they'll be the primary driver but i think more commonly much more commonly i would say 90 percent of the time there's a parent who's there on the consult. And that I talked to both of them. That makes my heart glow because we always hear about the negative connotations and sides of trans and the trans people I know actually have incredibly supportive families and are loved and secure. But again, mm -hmm. that, that is, it's, it's wonderful to hear from you that, that you're backing that up with what you're seeing. So mm -hmm. another question that I have is, when you have somebody that's coming in and they are going through the hormone therapy, but then they, you say, you can come off it and do that. Do you find that there is almost sometimes a negative spiral around the coming off the hormones 
Yes, it's a huge challenge to come off of hormone therapy because we talked about ovaries are pretty forgiving. You don't necessarily have to come up of testosterone, but it is really important to add in here that testicles hate estrogen. Okay, it is really not very forgiving. For people with testicles, it's actually really important to think about freezing sperm before you start estrogen. Okay, so this is actually very, it's different between what you're working with, okay? And luckily, freezing sperm is a much more straightforward process than doing IVF and getting eggs out. It typically involves masturbation and freezing that sperm. So it's and is not a, a bunch of hormones and injections. So it's more easy to access, I think. Um, it has its own challenges, but easier to access. When I have somebody who's been on estrogen and wants to try and freeze sperm, most people don't have sperm if they're on estrogen. So we'll usually do an analysis to start with. 95% of the time, there's no sperm, okay? Especially if they've been on estrogen for more than six months or a year. And it can take months for sperm to come back, and it also might not come back. Oh, wow. So sometimes you can go off of, it takes at least three to six months for sperm to come back after stopping estrogen and even might not come back at all after six, nine months. So very different than with ovaries and eggs. I think that the biggest concern that you have of stopping your hormone therapy is worsening gender dysphoria and then also reversal of physical characteristics especially for people who have started it really early. So that can be a deal breaker for a lot of people. If I had one message for people who are starting gender affirming therapy is if you have testicles, do everything in your power to freeze sperm before you start estrogen. If having a genetic child is important to you or you think it might be. That's um, that's actually amazing. And I feel like we have covered of amazing information to early stages of transition. Talking back now and people that I know and transgenders that I know that have done transition for a long time, do you still have possibilities to do IVF and surrogacy? Surgery, once those ovaries or testicles are gone, they're gone, right? If you have ovaries or testicles, there's still possibility. It just depends on what lengths you would go to find out that possibility. Mm -hmm. Every conversation that I have with somebody who's been on hormone replacement therapy or gender affirming therapy is different. Yeah. It's so, so personal. So, it, so in the United States, we know that is the gold standard for IVF and surrogacy. I am in Spain and Richard is mm -hmm. in London. When you have clients from Europe, Mm -hmm. and, or all over the world that come to the U.S. Let's say they go successfully through the IVF and surrogacy pro uh, protocol and they have a family. Do you think they face obstacles when it comes to coming back to their countries? That's a really interesting question. I would think so. Even when I have people who are not from Seattle, like here I am privileged in this like wonderful LGBTQ community. I have people who come to me from other parts of the United States where it's not a very accepted process, right? We know that surrogacy is not legal in a huge part of it, of Europe, right? So I, I would think, yeah, that's going to be potentially a challenge. I don't know that being, I think being a parent, being trans or non-binary and being a parent it's going to have a different flavor of challenges, but I don't know that it's necessarily more challenging. It's just, it's challenging across the board and just yeah. maybe challenging in a different way. Very interestingly, we actually are interviewing a trans family coming up. So for all of us, I know, watch out for that one. But I, so I think one of my biggest takeaways from this entire conversation is that it isn't a choice as to whether or not being a trans person exclude you from having a family. You can do it. We just need to prepare for it and 
even if you haven't prepared for it, come and talk to us to figure out what the options are. I think that's yeah. my main takeaway from what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. I see individual people or I see couples who might not have any of the ingredients, no eggs, no sperm, no uterus. So then we talk about using an egg donor and a sperm donor or using a donated embryo and using a gestational carrier. So you don't have to come with any of these ingredients to go through the fertility process and have a family. You just come as you are and let's figure out. That's my job is to source all those things. You don't have to figure that out. That's, that's my job. That's amazing because that, that could happen to anybody. Actually, I just read in the news that it was born the first baby out of a, uter a uterus transplant. Mm -hmm. would, that, would that be an option for a transgender person that removed their uterus? That is a great question. But yeah, there's been over 100 babies now that have been born from uterus transplants. They all have been cis women who were born either were born without a uterus or had their uterus removed. But yeah, there's been discussion in kind of the trans fertility community of why if somebody was born with testicles, why couldn't they have a uterus that's transplanted in there? So I think it's a really, I think theoretically, yeah, it's possible. I don't think it's something that's going to happen soon but it well, from a medical perspective it's technically possible i love that yeah it is because i get people pregnant who have uteruses and don't have ovaries you don't have to have ovaries to get pregnant we give you all the hormones that you need and most of pregnancy has to do with the placenta and the placenta makes all the hormones that you need yeah from a theoretical standpoint absolutely you could have a trans woman have a uterine transplant and be pregnant. Wow. This is not cool. The, this is really cool. This is gonna don't be surprised or do any face, but I've always, since I was young, I've always wanted to have a family, and I've always thought of the idea if I can carry my own baby, like considering stay. I, I don't find my define myself as a cisgender male. I would consider myself more non-binary but i've always wanted mm -hmm. to carry my own baby and i always wanted to know if my baby will float around my organs or if i could that's me as a kid years ago mm -hmm. i saw yeah. this movie about this man carrying a baby and i was just like i'm the schwarzenegger that probably but i need to eat it but yeah <laughs> but i've always wanted to imagine if a man can just get a way to carry a baby and not well you'd have to have a c-section no, I, I mean, from a medical standpoint, it's possible. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. I think that in my career, that will happen. And one question, what do you think you would like to give away to people that you think is not talked enough or that is a misconception that you feel like you have to repeat yourself constantly? I think that there is never a wrong time to talk to a fertility doctor. I'm happy to educate people even if they have no intention of doing any sort of fertility treatment. It's never wrong to schedule an appointment and talk to a fertility doctor. I think that's the biggest thing. Try not to be intimidated. I also think that it is really important to be selective about what fertility doctor or fertility clinic you go to. Not every fertility clinic is going to be knowledgeable and affirming. And even in my clinic, we care about this a lot. We can't think about this all the time. We think about it from the way we make phone calls to your intake forms to all the way down to having a baby, right? There's so many points in the process that we really try to do our best to be gender affirming. And we still make mistakes right? We still don't do it perfectly. And that's something that I tell my patients, like we care about this a lot, but we are not perfect. Okay. But we care about your experience. And so I do think that being intentional about what fertility clinic you go to is going to be important. Why are you interested in transgender, non-binary, Fertility, what got you into this? 
I was like a big weirdo when I was a medical student and I was really into, I thought I wanted to be a pediatric oncologist. So take care of kids with cancer. And I got really into learning about fertility preservation for cancer patients. And this was like later aughts when it started to become more of a thing in the literature and like all of the studies about ovarian tissue preservation and things like that. And I was like, this is so cool. How do I do this? I was like, oh, I have to be a fertility doctor. So then do OBGYN training for four years and then three years of a reproductive endocrinology and infertility fellowship. And when I was a fellow, I started really getting into like, why aren't we applying this to more people? Why are we just thinking about cancer patients? Why aren't we thinking more about age-related fertility decline? Why aren't we thinking more about transgender people? Like how can we need, there's a big empty space here. And so I started getting involved in it really early and helping with that momentum, which is really exciting in some of the earliest publications. And I don't, I just feel really passionate about people having their family when and if they want one. And that goes from just reproductive autonomy is the most important thing. If you don't want to have a family, don't. If you don't want to be pregnant, don't be pregnant, right? Make your own choices. If you want to have a family, we want to have all of those resources available to you. And I want you to say, no, thank you. I don't want to do fertility preservation rather than saying, I should have done fertility preservation. I want you to make that choice. And that's really important to me. Really beautiful to hear because the liability behind the medical industry, insurance companies, people who don't want to try new things and having somebody that mm -hmm. not only is an advocate, but a passionate about it works in a clinic. The entire clinic is an advocate for accepting come as you are. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think my, my biggest takeaways from what you said are there are options and come as you are. Be you. Mm -hmm. Let me do yeah. my job. You be you. I think that yeah. that is so beautiful. And I think on that note, we're going to have, we've taken up too much of your time. Um, we're going to have to call it a day. But just remember, anybody who's listening, just be you. Let mm -hmm. us do our job. I love that. That is amazing. <laughs> so, Stephanie, thank you so much for your thank time. You. I, I have a feeling we're going to be asking you back for more. So watch. <laughs> Always the happy. <laughs> Please, because you just open a Pandora box of questions because everything that you have said it has been so illuminated. I feel like it's been like taboo to talk about it and you have touched topics that have answered like questions and created new questions that I feel like I want to have you for hours on end. Well, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me.